All right, this is The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. This is the second part of chapter four, which is a 64 page chapter. Bod wondered just how long ago you had to go back before the deepest tomb inside this hill was on a plane. And he knew it must have been an extremely long time ago. He could feel the sleer winding its waves of fear around him like the tendrils of some carnivorous plant. He was beginning to feel cold and slow, as if he had been bitten in the heart by some arctic viper, and it was starting to pump its icy venom through his body. He took a step forward so he was standing against the stone slab, and he reached down and closed his fingers around the coldness of the brooch. Hish, whispered the sleer. We guard that for the master. He won't mind, said Bod. He took a step backward, walking toward the stone steps, avoiding the desiccated desiccated remains of people and animals on the floor. <coughs> the sleer writhed angrily, twining around the tiny chamber like ghost smoke. Then it slowed. It comes back, said the sleer in its tangled triple voice. Always comes back. Bod went up the stone steps inside the hill as fast as he could. At one point, he imagined that there was something coming after him, but when he broke out of the top in, into the Frobisher mauso mausoleum, he could breathe the cooled on air. Nothing moved or followed. Bod sat in the open air on the top of the hill and held the brooch. He thought it was all black at first, but then the sun rose and he could see that the stone in the center of the black metal was a swirling red. <clears throat> it was the size of a robin's egg and Bod stared into the stone, wondering if there were things moving in its heart his eyes and soul deep in the crimson world. If Bod had been smaller, he would have wanted to put it into his mouth. The stone was held in place by a black metal clasp, by something that looked like claws, with something else crawling around it. The something else looked almost snake-like, but it had too many heads. Bod wondered if that was what the sleer looked like in the daylight. He wandered down the hill, taking all the shortcuts he knew through the ivy tangled that, that covered the Bartleby family vault, and inside the sound of the Bartlebys grumbling and readying for, readying for sleep, and on over and through the railings and into the potter's field. He called, Liza, Liza, and looked around. Good morrow, young lummox, said Liza's voice. Bod could not see her, but there was an extra shadow beneath the hawthorn tree, and as he approached it, the shadow resolved itself into something pearlescent and translucent in the early morning light, something girl-like, something gray-eyed. I should be decently sleeping, she said. What kind of carrying on is this? Your headstone, he said. I wanted to know what you want, I, what you want on it. My name, she said. It must have my name on it with a big E for Elizabeth, like the old queen that died when I was born, and a big H for Hemstock, more than I care for not, more than, I ca more than that I care not, for I did never master my letters. What about dates, asked Bod. William the Conqueror, 1066, she sang in the whisper of the dawn wind and the hawthorn tree, a big E, if you please, and a big H, Did you have a job, asked Bob? I mean, you weren't being, when you weren't being a witch. I done laundry, said the dead girl. And then the morning sunlight flooded the wasteland and Bod was alone. It was nine in the morning when all the world is sleeping. Bod was determined to stay awake. Uh, he was, after all, on a mission. He was eight years old and the world beyond the graveyard held no terrors for him. Clothes, he would need clothes. His usual dress of a gray winding sheet was, he knew, quite wrong. It was good in the graveyard, the same color as stone and as shadows, but if he were going to go dare, if he were going to dare the world beyond the graveyard walls, he would need to blend in there. There were some clothes in the crypt beneath the ruined church, but Bod did not want to go down to the crypt, not even in daylight. While Bod was prepared to justify himself to Master and Mistress Owens, he was not about to explain himself to Silas. The very thought of those dark eyes angry, or worse, still disappointed, filled him with shame. There was a gardener's hut at the far end of the graveyard, a small green building that smelled like motor oil, and in which the old mower sat and rusted, unused, along with an assortment of ancient garden tools. 
The hut had been abandoned when the last gardener had retired, before Bod was born, and the task of keeping the graveyard had been shared between the council, who sent in a man to cut the grass and clean the paths once a month from April to September, and the local volunteers with friends of the graveyard. A huge padlock on the door protected the contents of the hut, but Bod had long ago discovered that the loose wooden board in the back had discovered the loose wooden board in the back. Sometimes he would go to the gardener's hut and sit and think when he wanted to be by himself. As long as he had been going to the hut, there had been a brown working man's jacket hanging on the back of the door, forgotten or abandoned years before, along with a green stained pair of gardening jeans. The jeans were much too big for him, but he rolled up the cuffs until his feet showed, and then he made a belt out of the brown garden twine and tied it around his waist. There were boots in one corner, and he tried putting them on, but they were so big and encrusted with mud and concrete that he could barely shuffle in them. If he took a step, the boots remained on the floor of the shed. He pushed the jacket out through the space of the, in the loose board, squeezed himself out, and then put it on. If he rolled up the sleeves, he decided it worked quite well. It had big pockets, and he thrust his hands into them and felt quite the dandy. Bod walked down to the main gate of the graveyard and looked through the bars. A bus rattled past in the street. There were cars and noise and shops. Behind him, the, a cool green shade uh, overgrown with trees and ivy, home. His heart pounding, Bob, Bod walked out into the world. Abenazer Bolger had seen some odd types in his time. If you owned a shop like Abenazer's, you'd see them too. The shop in the worn of the streets of the old town, a little bit antique shop, a little bit junk shop, a little bit pawnbrokers, and not even Abenazer himself was quite entirely certain which bit was which, brought to odd types and strange people, some of them wanting to buy, some of them needing to sell. Abenazer Bolger traded over the counter, buying and selling, and he did a better trade behind the counter and in the back room, accepting objects that may not have been acquired entirely honestly, and then quietly shifting them on. His business was an iceberg. Only the dusty little shop was visible on the surface. The rest of it was underneath. And that was just how Abenazer Bulger wanted it. Abenazer Bulger had thick spectacles and a permanent expression of mild distaste, as if he had just realized that the milk in his tea had been on the turn, and he could not get the sour taste of it out of his mouth. The expression served him well when people tried to sell him things. Honestly, he would tell them sour-faced, it's not really worth anything at all. I'll give you what I can, though, as it has sentimental value. You were lucky to get anything like what you thought you wanted from Abenazer Bulger. A business like Abenazer Bulger's brought in strange people, but the boy who came in that morning was one of the strangest Abenazer could remember in a lifetime of cheating strange people out of their valuables. He looked to be about seven years old and dressed in his grandfather's clothes. He smelled like a shed. His hair was long and shaggy, and he seemed extremely grave. His hands were deep in the pockets of a dusty brown jacket, but even with the hands out of sight, Abenazer could see that something was clutched extremely tightly, protectively, in the boy's right hand. Excuse me, said the boy. Aye, aye, Sonny Jim, said Abenazer Bulger warily. Kids, he thought. Either they've nicked something or they're trying to sell their toys. Either way, he usually said no. Buy stolen property from a kid, next thing you knew you'd have an enraged adult accusing you of having given little Johnny or Matilda a tenor for their wedding ring. More trouble than they was worth, kids. I need something for a friend of mine, said the boy, and I thought maybe you could buy something I've got. I don't buy stuff from kids, said Ebenezer Bulger flatly. Bod took his hand out of his pocket and put the brooch down on the grimy, grimy countertop. Bulger glanced down at it, and then he looked at it. He removed his spectacles. He took an eyepiece from the countertop, and he screwed it into his eye. He turned on a little light on the counter and examined the brooch through the eyeglass. Snake stone, he said to himself, not the boy. And then he took the eyepiece out replaced it, and replaced his glasses and fixed the boy with a sour, suspicious look. Where did you get this? Ebenezer Bulger asked. Bod said, do you want to buy it? You stole it. You've nicked this from a museum or somewhere, didn't you? No, said Bod flatly. Are you going to buy it or shall I go and find somebody who will? 
Abenazer Bolger's sour mood changed then. Suddenly he was all affability. He smiled broadly. I'm sorry, he said. It's just, you don't see many pieces like this. Not in a shop like this. Not outside of a museum, but I would certainly like it. Tell you what, why don't we sit down over tea and biscuits? I've got a packet of chocolate chip cookies in the back room and decided to have them and decide how much something like this is worth, eh? Bob was relieved that the man was finally being friendly. I need enough to buy a stone, he said. A headstone for a friend of mine. Well, she's not really my friend, just someone I know. I think she helped make my leg better, you see. Ebenezer Bulger, paying, a little, paying little attention to the boy's prattle, led him behind the counter and opened the door to the storeroom, a windowless little space, every inch of which was crammed high with teetering cardboard boxes, each filled with junk. There was a safe in there, in the corner, a big old, a big old one. There was a box filled with violins, an accumulation of stuffed dead animals, chairs without seats, books and prints. There was a small desk beside the door, and Abenazer Bulger pulled up the only chair and sat down, letting Bod stand. Abenazer rummaged in a drawer in which Bod could see a half-empty bottle of whiskey and pulled out an almost-finished packet of chocolate chip cookies, and he offered one to the boy. He turned on the desk light, looked at the brooch again, the swirls of red and orange in the stone, and he examined the black metal band that encircled it suppressing a little shiver at the expression on the heads of the snake thing. This is old, he said. It's priceless, he thought. Probably not really worth much, but you never know. Bod's face fell. Abenazer Bulger tried to look reassuring. I just need to know that it's not stolen, though, before I can give you a penny. Did you take it from your mom's dresser? Nick it from a museum? You can tell me. I'll not get you into trouble. I just need to know. Bod shook his head. He munched on his cookie. Then where did you get it? Bod said nothing. Abenazer Bulger did not want to put down the brooch, but he pushed it across the desk to the boy. If you can't tell me, he said, you'd better take it back. There has to be trust on both sides, after all. Nice doing business with you. Sorry it couldn't go any further. Bod looked worried. Then he said... I found it in an old grave, but I can't say where he stopped because naked greed and excitement had replaced the friendliness on Abenazer Bulger's face. And there's more like this there? Bod said, if you don't want to buy it, I'll find someone else. Thank you for the biscuit. Bulger said, you're in a hurry, eh? Mom and dad waiting for you, I expect. The boy shook his head, then wished he had nodded. Nobody waiting? Good. Abenazer Bulger closed his hands and the, around the brooch. Now, you tell me exactly where you found this, eh? I don't remember, said Bod. Too late for that, said Abenazer Bulger. Suppose you have a little think for a bit uh, about where it came from. Then while you've thought, we'll have a little, when you've thought, we'll have a little chat and you'll tell me. He got up and walked out of the room, closing the door behind him. He locked it with a large metal key. He opened his hand and looked at the brooch and smiled hungrily. There was a ding from the bell uh, above the shop door to let him know someone had entered, and he looked up guiltily, but there was no one there. The door was slightly ajar, though, and Bulger pushed it shut. Then, for good measure, he turned around the sign in the window so it said, Closed! He pushed the bolt shut. Didn't want any busybodies turning up today. The autumn day had turned from sunny to gray, and a light patter of rain down, uh, ran down the grubby shop window. Abenazer Bulger picked up the telephone from the counter and pushed at the buttons with fingers that barely shook. Pay dirt, Tom, he said. Get over here as soon as you can. Bod realized that he was trapped when he heard the lock turn in the door. He pulled on the door, but it held fast. He felt stupid for having been lured inside, foolish for not trusting his first impulses to get as far away from the sour-faced man as possible. He had broken all the rules of the graveyard, and everything had gone wrong. What would Silas say? Or the Owenses? He could feel, him, feel in himself beginning to panic, and he suppressed it, pushing the worry back down inside him. He knew it would, it would all be good. He knew that. Of course, he needed to get out. He examined the room he was trapped in. It was a little more than a storeroom with a desk in it. The only entrance was the door. 
He opened the desk drawer, finding nothing but small pots of paint used for brightening up antiques and a paintbrush. He wondered if he'd be able to throw paint uh, in the man's face and blind him for long enough to escape. He opened the top of a pot of paint and dipped it in his finger. What are you doing? asked a voice close to his ear. Nothing, said Bod, screwing the top of the paint, uh, on the paint pot and dropping it into one of the jacket's enormous pockets. Liza Hempstock looked at him, unimpressed. Why are you in here, she asked, and who's old Bagelard out there? It's his shop. I was trying to sell him something. Why? None of your beeswax. She sniffed. Well, she said, you should get back to the graveyard. I can't. He's locked me in. Of course you can. Just slip through the wall. He shook his head. I can't. I can only do it at home because they gave me the freedom of the graveyard when I was a baby. He looked up at her under the electric light. It was hard to see her properly, but Bod had spent his life talking to dead people. Anyway, what are you doing here? What are you doing out of the graveyard? It's daytime and you're not like Silas. You're meant to stay in the graveyard. She said, there's rules for those in graveyards, but not for those as was buried in unhallowed ground. Nobody tells me what to do or where to go. She glared at the door. I don't like that man, she said. I'm going to see what he's doing. A flicker and Bod was alone in the room once more. He heard a rumble of distant thunder. In the clattered darkness of Bulger's antiquities, Abenazer Bulger looked up suspiciously, certain that someone was watching him, then realized he was being foolish. That boy, the boy's locked in the room, he told himself. The front door's locked. He was polishing the metal clasps surrounding the snake stone as gently and as carefully as an archaeologist on a dig, taking off the black and revealing the glittering silver beneath it. He was beginning to regret calling Tom Hustings over. Although Hustings was big and good for scaring people, he was also beginning to regret that he was going to have to sell the brooch when he was done. It was special. The more it glittered under the tiny light on his counter, the more he wanted it to be his and only his. There was more where this came from, though. The boy would not tell him. The boy would lead him to it. The boy. An idea struck him and he put down the brooch reluctantly and opened a drawer behind the counter, taking out a metal biscuit tin filled with envelopes and cards and slips of paper. He reached in and took out a card only slightly larger than a business card. It was black edged. There was no name or address printed on it though, only one word handwritten in the center in an ink that had faded to brown, Jack. On the back of the card in pencil, Abenazer Bulger had written instructions to himself in his tiny, precise handwriting as a reminder, although he would not have been likely to forget the use of the card, how to use it to summon the man Jack. No, not summon, invite. You did not summon people like him. A knocking on the outer door of the shop. Bulger tossed the card down onto the counter and walked over to the door, peering out into the afternoon. Hurry up! called Tom Hustings. It's miserable out here, dismal. I'm getting soaked. Bulger unlocked the door and Tom Hustings pushed his way into the inn, his raincoat and hair dripping. What's so important you can't talk to me about it over the phone then? Our fortune, said Abenazer Bulger with a, his sour face. That's what. Hustings took off his raincoat and hung it on the back of the shop door. What is it? Something good fell off the back of a lorry? Treasure, said Abenazer Bulger. Two kinds. He took his friend over to the counter, showed him the brooch under the little light. It's old, isn't it? From pagan times, said Abenazer. Before, from druid times, before the Romans came. It's called a snake stone. Seen him in museums. I've never seen metal work like that, or, or one so fine. Must have belonged to a king. The lad who found it says it came from a grave. Think of a barrow filled with stuff like this. Might be worth doing it legit, said Hustings thoughtfully. Declare it as, tr as treasure trove. They have to pay us market value for it and we can make them name it after us. The Hustings Bulger bequest. Bulger Hustings, said Abenazer automatically. Then he said, there's a few people I know of, people with real money, would pay more than market value if they could hold it as you are. For Tom Hustings was fingering the brooch gently, like a man stroking a kitten. And there'd be no questions asked. 
He reached out his hand. Reluctantly, Tom Hustings passed the, him the brooch. You said two kinds of treasure, said Hustings. What's the other? Ebenezer Bolger picked up the black-edged card, held it out for his friend's inspection. Do you know what this is? His friend shook his head. Ebenezer put the card down on the counter. There's a party. There's a party is looking for another party. So? The way I heard it, said Ebenezer Bolger, the other party is a boy. There's boys everywhere, said Tom Hustings, running all around, getting into trouble. I can't abide them, so there's a party looking for a particular boy. This lad looks to be the right sort of age. He's dressed, well, you'll see how he's dressed. And he found this. It could be him. And if it is him, Abenazar Bulger picked up the card again by the edge, waved it back and forth, slowly, as if running the edge along an imaginary flame. Here comes a candle to light you to bed, he began. And here comes a chopper to chop off your head, concluded Tom Hustings thoughtfully. But look, you, if we call the man Jack, we lose the boy. And if we lose the boy, we lose the treasure. And the two men went back and forth on it, weighing the merits and disadvantages of reporting the boy or of collecting the treasure, which had grown in their minds to a huge underground cavern filled with precious things. And as they debated, Abenazar pulled out a bottle of slow gin from beneath the counter and poured them both a generous tot. To assist the celebrations. Liza was soon bored with their discussion, which went back and forth around like a whirligig, getting nowhere. And so she went back into the storeroom to find Bod standing in the middle of the room with his eyes tightly closed and his fists clenched and his face all screwed up as if he had a toothache, almost purple from holding his breath. What you doing of now? She asked, unimpressed. He opened his eyes. Trying to fade, he said. Liza, Liza sniffed. Try again, she said. And this is where we will stop today.